on today's story beat. Don't take rejection as putting you off. Just keep doing it. And I've met so many people down the years who, you know, they ask me for advice or they ask me, or they say, I want to be a writer. And I say, well, what have you done? How many pages have you done? Have you, have you a book written? What is it? Or a short story? And they, no, I've never written anything because I don't know how. And I also say, but if there's one thing we are armed with in this life, it's words. They're free of charge. You may need a, a pen or a word processor. Okay, but we have words. And if you have an idea, put it down on paper. You can refine it later. You can get help with editing, but just begin. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Wayne Byrne, is an acclaimed author and film historian from Ireland. He started his career working for local County Kildare newspapers before being invited to write for the iconic Irish pop culture Bible Hot Press magazine as a music, book, and restaurant critic. His debut book, The Cinema of Tom DeCillo, Include Me Out, was released in 2018. Wayne followed it with well-received works on subjects like Burt Reynolds, cinematographer Nick McLean, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, and legendary Hollywood filmmaker Walter Hill. I've read both Welcome to Elm Street and Walter Hill, The Cinema of a Hollywood Maverick, and can tell you that they're both deeply researched, entertainingly detailed looks at how influential filmmakers create the dreams the world loves to watch. I highly recommend Wayne's work to you. Look for the release of Wayne's latest book, Hired Guns, Portraits of Women in Alternative Music, co-written with his best friend, acclaimed musician Amanda Kramer, who's been the keyboardist, vocalist of The Psychedelic Furs, 10,000 Maniacs, Susie Sue, The Golden Palominos, and Information Society. He's also busy writing three upcoming books, including another collaboration with Amanda Kramer, which is a study of the evolution of film soundtracks in the revolutionary New Hollywood era. Wayne's also working with cinematographer Roy Wagner on a biography documenting Wagner's acclaimed career called Beyond the Shadows, as well as a critical cultural overview of the Halloween movies entitled The Ongoing Halloween Franchise, 13 Films and Counting. So for all those reasons and many more, it's my distinct privilege to welcome the outstanding author and film historian Wayne Byrne to Story Beat today. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Steve. It's an honor to be here. Oh, really the, the honor is mine. So, all right, let's go back in time a little bit. At what age were you? How old were you when you realized the impact that movies, motion pictures, had on you? I was four years old, and I remember that specifically. I remember... I went to see Masters of the Universe, the He-Man movie with Dolph Lundgren <laughs> and back in 1987. It was the first movie I'd ever seen on a big screen. And I remember to this day sitting in that grand screening room and as the Canon logo came up across the screen, I remember looking up in the darkness and I, for some reason I feel back then the projection from the screening booth was stronger because I remember just that laser dart you know sure of, of the projection and i thought what is this you know the canon logo came up then it gave way to the you know the, the, the opening credits and that wonderful bill conti score and this ominous voiceover and i just thought what is this it was just a complete oral visual overload and i remember looking up at that stream of light thinking wow i'm in you know this is incredible and i sat through that movie and it blew my mind and i went back a week later my dad brought me back again and we were, I, again, I was blown away and I was hooked from that moment on cinema grabbed me. And my dad was into movies. He was into like, you know, the John Ford movies, John Wayne Westerns. So we had a couple of videos at home and he would, you know, show me these movies. And I was, I was like kind of be, beguiled by this, you know, black and white imagery, uh, you know, the, the covered wagons, you know, Fort Apache and all that kind of thing. And I just watched these films, not knowing exactly what they were. I just knew they were Westerns. They were black and white. And it was, it was some form of cinema on the smaller screen. 
and my dad would tape movies off the tv for me like he would pick me up from school this is like when i'm four or five six years old and he would say oh i taped a movie off tv last night for you you might like it it's called lethal weapon you know so i'd go home <laughs> and he'd stick on lethal weapon for me and then next week oh i taped a film called halloween i think you might like it you know so <laughs> I'm this tender age and he's showing me these uh videos you know these these movies which were you know quite mature i guess you could call it but um, that cemented my relationship with cinema was seeing Masters of the Universe on the big screen. Who who would imagine that He-Man and Masters of the Universe would change a person's life? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. And it really, to this day, I mean, it's one of those films where I, I love it. I have to watch it at least twice a year. And if I was to review it objectively, I'd have to go, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't say that's a five-star movie. It's not. <laughs> was that directed by Gary Goddard? It was, yeah. It was so indeed. I have actually worked with Gary Goddard, <laughs> just right, for the record. Okay. Yeah. But he, he made a great movie in that movie. You know, it's just so there's something fun and energetic about it. It's a for, you know, for a four year old, it's a big, colorful, spectacular movie. So, you know, it's, it was easy to see why I, like I wasn't a huge fan of He-Man, like the cartoon or anything. It was just this big spectacle that came out that summer in our in our town and that, that cinema, which had one one screen, you know, it was a small cinema. So. That was the big thing that week. That then started you down the road to loving genre work, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because you know, as I say, my dad would introduce me to tape these things like Halloween or Halloween tree off the TV and we'd rent movies from the local video store. So obviously he'd have to go in and rent it for me. I'd be like, get me that one, get me that one, <laughs> you know, and it'd be the cover, the VHS cover with Michael Myers on it or whatever. And he, he kind of fostered that love of cinema for me, you know what I mean? And nobody really said, well, why are you watching these movies? These movies aren't for you. You're too young. So I think that allowed me to explore, you know, horror genre, uh, Westerns, action movies, you know, and that really set me in motion. And it was only, it was later on when I was, I'd say 12 or 13, when I discovered Tom DeCillo's work and that changed my life again. So once again, cinema put me on a path. In what know, way so. did it change your, your thinking, your world? It was Johnny Swade and I was visiting my sister in another town and we went to the local video shop and I was browsing. There was this like art house foreign films section. And even though Johnny Swade isn't foreign film, it's not French or Italian, it's an American movie. I seen it. Something about the cover stood out among because all the other videotapes were from like the Tartan video label or the uh, artificial eye. And they had a kind of a gray uniform look to them. Every every film looked the same on the cover. But Johnny Swade had this really bright yellow pink font and whatever it was and I kind of I thought that's Brad Pitt that's that movie star what's he doing in this section and I picked up the, the cover and I thought you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna rent this and I brought it home and watched it and I swear to god Steve I didn't want to bring the tape back it was an <laughs> education it was like nothing I had ever seen it was arty it was surreal it was different it was not what I was used to seeing you know it was not a Steven Seagal movie or a John Wayne movie or a Freddie movie it was something totally original and it opened my eyes up to this whole idea of world cinema art house cinema independent cinema so i had my eyes opened at the age of four with masters of the universe and then at 12 with johnny suede and ultimately it's that it's johnny suede i have the credit with putting me on the path to becoming a writer well how interesting were, were you always a reader of film history and and the film world i was a film history buff but not a reader so I would, you know, voracious appetite for documentaries and any information I could get on film criticism. But I wasn't a big reader of books in general, like uh, fiction or anything non-film related. I, I was consumed by film. I was terrible academically. I had no interest in sports, school or anything else other than cinema. So, you know, that's why maybe my my entry into literature came late because I didn't have that traditional patch, you know, college job that kind of thing. I was turned away from every college I ever applied for because they could see my scores from school. And they're like, this guy is not what we want here. So, so how did you then start down the road toward writing about all this stuff? Because I tried to go to college to study film and literature because I thought, you know, I want to do something with film, but there's not really much of a film industry in Ireland in terms of making movies. Um, there's a couple of film courses and I thought, well, maybe I could write about movies. So I thought, OK, well, I'll go study film and literature. Well, like I say, I finished school. I went straight into work because I did terribly in school. But I, enough time had passed where over here in Ireland, you can apply to a college if you're a mature student, quote unquote. You have to be a certain age, I think 27 or 28. 
and supposedly at that age your scores from school don't count so even if you did terribly you can still be considered for the course but every college I applied to turned me down and you know the, the notes came back said he, he's not you know he's not good for the school or whatever and you know I got one rejection letter too many and it was from from a big university here and I said you know what I'm going to inquire why did they turn me down because I thought I gave a really good application and you can, you can, you know, you can request their notes to see where they marked you down or whatever it was. Sure. And the thing that really, really got me and really inspired me to just go ahead and do it was I got a note or I, this application came with a note that said, this guy is obviously not well read enough. And I thought to myself, well, how do they know what I've read? That's not part of the application. They never ask what you've read or how many books you've read. I thought, like I say, I thought my application was quite well put together. And I thought, well, that was so flippant that they would reject me with this kind of idea of they, that they had of me. You know, maybe maybe I wasn't, the application wasn't well written or something about that, that they said, no, he's not good enough. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and write the book. There was one book I wanted. Again, it comes back to Tom DeChillo and Johnny Swade. There was one book I really wanted to write. And if I went to college and became a writer, I thought the one book I wanted to work on was a book on Tom DeChillo because for years I would go into bookstores and ask, is there a, any sign of a book on Tom DeChillo coming out? And of course, the answer would be, no, don't see anything there. And, you know, Tom is referenced in, you know, movie encyclopedias and things like that. So he's, he's considered an important director, you know, so he's he's mentioned here and there throughout these different uh, books, but there was no full book, you know, studying his career or studying his films. And I thought, well, if I go to college, study film, study literature, I can write that book, you know. Um, so with, with all those rejections, I said, I'm just going to do it. And I had an in with Tom already because I'd written him a letter before, an email, just as a fan, you know. So we had a little communication going. And I said to him, I explained the situation with the college. And I said, Tom, you know, I just wanted to, to go to college so one day I could write a book in your career. Wow. Can I just do it? You know, and all credits to Tom. He said, Wayne, if you can come over here to New York, spend a week, I'll be there for you. We can talk about each of my movies and that, that can be your research. So, Well, um, he probably well, had no one coming out of the woodwork at him at that moment. So you, yeah, you were, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you were just, big in, made a big impression on him. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, we, we got on really well, you know, in our initial communications and, you know, I really, really, really admired him as a filmmaker. I really enjoyed his company or our back and forths. And he was just a really warm, warm person. And when he said I could come over and spend some time with him, I thought I have to do this. I have, this is. So were you spending a lot of time re at that point, reading stuff so that you understood how to write stuff? No. Absolutely not. So how did you learn how to write? It was just the whatever I saw on the screen, whatever my thoughts were, I put it on the page. I had no idea how to write. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the, I was, I'm unschooled in uh, literature, put it like that. But one of the great things was, and, you know, it was very flattering. When I did, you know, after five years of working on that book, and I, there was one publisher I really, really wanted. And that was Columbia University Press, because they had a, a series of books under their Wallflower imprint called Director's Cuts. And I always thought, I was a big fan of those books and I thought that would be great to have a Tom DeChillo, you know, entry in that series because they really dive deep into director's works, you know, film by film. And I took a chance and I just said, you know what, screw it. I didn't know how to approach a publisher or an editor or anybody. So what I did was I went on the Columbia website, Columbia University website, and I found kind of a, just a random admin, you know, office at CUP or whatever. And I stupidly, you know, when I look back at it now, it was kind of dumb. I attached the whole manuscript you know, this is after five years of working with Tom, working with all the actors and everybody else. Right. It is email. And I just said, hey, can you get this to uh, somebody who works in the director's cuts department, the film department, or whatever, thinking I'm never going to hear back from this. This is going to be deleted or junk junk file, whatever. And a bit, I'd say about three weeks later, I got an email back from an editor in that department. And he said, Wayne, we love this book. Tom DeChillo is a director we, we consider to be very important and worthy of study. We want to offer you a contract. Wow. So I, my mind was absolutely blown once again. And I said straight away, the, the, the paranoid, paranoia kicked in. I was like, oh, dear God, they're going to want to change this, this, this and this. And I don't know how to, you know, work with editors. I don't have no experience. Along the way, I did get some newspaper work, but that was in the five years that I was working on the book. But when it comes to books, I was like, how am I going to do this? So the guy got back to me and he says, the book is perfect as it is. Do not change a word. Wow. The only, the only thing we want you to do is add an extra little 
opening to put it in an academic context to say why Tom is so important, why his films are worth studying. And it was only an extra three or four pages at the, you know, to the front. So I said, of course, you know, but I was still blown away by the fact that they didn't want me to change anything. Well, you, know? well, you, you should be blown away because most books go through rigorous rewrites and edits and all kinds of things. Yeah. But, you know, and when I think back, I guess it was five years of really working on it and, you know, working with, with Tom as well, because, you know, having Tom there to read your pieces and to offer you a little bit of advice here or there was so valuable when I look back on it. You know what I mean? He's a, he's a, he himself is a wonderful writer. So I'm, I'm just, I was lucky that I had the perfect subject and I found the publisher, the publisher who I really, really wanted was interested. So I, I really, I guess my ambition in literature peaked with the first book. <laughs> everything else since then has just been sugar on top so you have obviously then had success publishing other books was there at some juncture where you thought to yourself was it then when they said we'll take your book that you thought hey you know what maybe i am pretty good at this did you have an epiphany like that i don't think i've ever questioned it um i don't think i've ever sat back enough because i never really had time because as soon as that book was published i thought i have to keep going here i have to do another book because i thought i'm in now i have a you know like I say, Tom the Chill one was the one I really wanted, but I thought, okay, I want to keep going with this. It was intoxicating, you know, for to see a book coming out and to just to, to do the work. But I never thought I'm I'm good, you know. Um the reviews were were very good, but I've never kind of looked back. I've never kind of questioned my style of writing or my approach to it. It was just to me, it was instinctual. As I say, it was I put my thoughts down and I formulate them whatever way. But I, I don't kind of I don't know enough about literature to look at a, a sentence or a paragraph and think, well, that's formulated correctly. You know, I just, if it reads well to me, well, then I'm, I'm happy with it. Do others give you that kind of feedback? Hey, you could do better in this paragraph. You could do better on that sentence. You could do better on this chapter. Has anybody ever done that with you? Not really. The only editorial kind of back and forth I've had is strangely from some of my publishers, they're American publishers. And I often t tend to use Irish turns of phrase. Sure. Which my, my, my editor might say to me, what does that sentence mean? <laughs> you know, and it's just, it comes out natural to me, you know, a certain phrase just, you know, or whatever it is. And I kind of go, oh, this is what it means. So I'll just, you know, rephrase it slightly for a general audience, people who aren't from Kildare. Well, I'm going to guess that you've seen so many American movies, you sort of understand what Americanisms are like. Exactly. Yeah. And again, reading, reading writers who, if I do read writers, they're generally American critics as well, or historians. So yeah, I guess, you know, if if I've done well with this, it's because of the films I've watched and the, the the people I admire. You know, their work influences my writing. So you know, if if I'm any good at anything, it's because of them. So I think one of the things that shines through, and you're expressing it right here, is that you write with passion. You're really into what you're writing about. It's not a task to you or a chore. It's it's something that you really love, and I think that that comes through in the way that you write the books. I assume that's correct. Yes, absolutely. And if if you look at the subjects in my books, they are only passion projects. They could only be, you know, I've I've attempted one book, which was more of an idea from an editor, you know, who suggested some things, and I I tried it. I just I now it was about a film I like and some filmmakers I like, but I it just didn't because it didn't come from the heart. I think it didn't have the same feel. It felt more like work, and to the frustration I'm sure of other editors and agents. I've never taken a book purely for commercial gain or anything like that. It has to be something I'm deeply interested in. And every subject I've written about so far is something or somebody who is, whose work has meant something deeply to me. And I, I, will, I will only ever continue down that road. It will you, never you have to connect to it. Oh, without a doubt. It's the only, for me, it's the only way to do it because if you're going to be sitting up till three o'clock in the morning, hammering away on the laptop, you have to love what you're, you're writing about, you know, otherwise I, I could not do it because it is a lot of work. You have to invest yourself completely. And sometimes, you know, unfortunately your, your personal life might suffer. You're, you're, you're short on time to devote to other aspects of your life, your, your family, your wife, your, your friends. So, you know, what you're doing really has to be worth it. Do you think of yourself as a storyteller? I do. I do. And that's um, because I'm telling the story, I'm telling the, you know, the arc of, of somebody's life. Right. You know, and documenting their, uh, their stories and all that. So I think it does. I do. I do think of myself as a storyteller more than I definitely don't think of it as journalism. Some people have, have referred to it as journalism. 
but I've I've worked in journalism and that's completely it's a completely different beast because you're you're hammering out facts it's very cold it's you know it's it's a different kind of thing what I do with the books I'm I'm trying to do something which is close to art and that sounds pretentious I'm sure but to me it's art because you're so, formulating things which are you know out of your brain from somewhere deep within and that to me is art you're more of a an a historian and a someone who is doing biography than you are really uh, some kind of a journalist though there's journalistic you know sense of it because yeah. you are stating facts and so on that's all in there and you're doing something you're writing something that is absolutely based on reality but um, nevertheless it's it's more of a historian's look than it is of a journalist or a critic's look absolutely and for me what's important about these books as well is that they do not fall into the realm of academic or academic jargon. Exactly. Because, you know, I want these books to be readable to somebody who isn't necessarily a Tom DeCillo fan or an Elm Street fan or a Walter Hill fan. If somebody can pick up the book and just enjoy the, the, the prose, enjoy the story, to me, that's so much more important than taking on some kind of highfalutin academic approach, which to me is, is the worst kind of book. I, I, I've closed many books in recent times, you know, when I'm doing research for something and you start a book and you're like, Man, it's, it, this is tough to wade through. So you kind of go flicking around for the goods, but definitely it's, not. It's not. always better when a book, the kind of book that you write, it's always better when that kind of a book is entertaining rather than feeling like you have to study it. Absolutely. Totally. And to me, it, and the entertainment aspect of it is high up the front for me because it's, at the end of the day, these subjects entertained me. And if I can't get that sense of entertainment and passion across to the reader, well, then I've failed somehow. So what then caused you to focus on genre films? Was it because you and, and genre filmmakers, was it because of your upbringing and what really struck you early on and what you then followed through? Or was there some other purpose to it? I think it's it goes back to the childhood because uh, like the Elm Street ones, the Walter Hill ones, you know, Burt Reynolds, this all goes back to my childhood. These were the films which were on TV in my house. They were the films I rented or they were the films that my dad showed me or he was watching you know so they, they come from back then and I never really kind of looked at them as genre films as such because to me it was everything was kind of entertainment in terms of like even up to Johnny Swade which is very you know more esoteric and art house you know I, I never kind of separate separate them in terms of okay that's a b-movie or anything like that but in, if to put them in genre terms I think it is just an immediate there's something immediate about genre films where you know, the kind of, how would you say, everything is on the surface in terms of what they need to hit. You know, a horror film needs to be scary. It needs to have certain, it needs to hit certain generic registers. Likewise, a Western or likewise, an action film. You know what I mean? And that's why I think there's an, a sense of immediacy to them, that, which is very attractive, especially to someone who's young and only getting into cinema and discovering cinema for the first time. You know, that's why I think genre films really hit people early on. And if you look at the horror genre, there are so many fans out there who are so devoted to the horror genre and they probably have a similar story to me where they discovered them very early and they become part of their life, almost inseparable. They live those movies. I mean, oh, sure. I've written a book on Elm Street, but there are millions of fans out there who probably know way more about Elm Street than I do. And I meet those fans, you know what I mean? They'll tell me, why didn't you write about this? Why didn't you talk about that? And I said, well, that just, I had my, my story arc and that was it. You know, you could write a thousand page book on Elm Street if you're to include every mythology that has, you know, been built up by the fans or anything like that. But you, you have to draw a line, of course. But that's, I think that's one of the great things about genre film. They, they attract people early on with those registers, you know, and at the end of the day, I think it's fun. Everybody likes being scared because there's something safe in it you know it kind of reminds us that you know life isn't actually so bad i don't have a guy with knives for fingers chase me in my dream <laughs> you know <laughs> or you know you're, you're you're not taking a canoe down into some wilderness like you know in deliverance at, so. at least at least not yet exactly <laughs> let's not rule anything out <laughs> so within a series of movies like a nightmare on elm street or halloween within a series of movies what makes one of that series stand out from another? What makes a movie good within a series? Well, I would point to Nightmare on Elm Street 3 for the, for the Elm Street one. And I, I guess over the years that has become a, become a fan favorite. 
And I would put it down to the fact that I think Chuck Russell really perfected some of the things that Wes Craven wasn't able to with his um, budget, for example, on the first one. Wes Craven's film is an absolute masterpiece, but you know there's certain limitations. And I think Chuck Russell, by the time he you know got part three, he had some amazing collaborators like Roy Wagner, the cinematographer, and other people you know on board with that. And he really made a film which had all the elements which made the first one great, but just had the budget and the personnel to take it to a slightly higher plane. You know, I, I think both of them as masterpieces, but there's, I don't know, Tree has the edge on one, I think, it, for certain things. And I think it comes down to, it has a certain style, which is, I put, again, I put down to the cinematography. Roy Wagner's work is simply amazing on that. Um, but it builds upon the mythology. And to me, that's always really interesting. And one of the things I love about Tree in particular is, what I love about mythology is I love when films or stories go into social backgrounds of characters or the milieu. Um, you know, so you're talking in part three, you're talking about troubled kids who come from, you know, the whole thing of Elm Street is the kids who are affected by Freddie are kids who come from troubled homes, you know, um, whether there's divorces involved or alcoholism or some other aberrant force, which is tearing the family apart. And part three really kind of goes into that. You know, it, it talks to these kids and you get a sense of why they're in the institution, why they're being hounded by Freddie. And Freddie plays upon that. He plays upon whatever it was that tore their lives apart. Freddie plays upon it and it makes for a more terrifying thing because if somebody knows your deepest, darkest, you know, fears and uses it against you, you know, that's that's a horrible thing. So I'm all into social context and social background. For me, that's a key theme in what I love about cinema. Let's talk about your process for a little bit. Do you write every day or you do practice that craft every day? Not anymore. Not since last year, because I almost burned out last year. You know, I was working on three or four books last year and it got to the point where I was working on them all together. Now I'm working on three books together at the moment, but I don't work on them together. I wouldn't work on three of them in one day. But last year I released two books, but I was working across four all at the one time in some in some cases. And it was literally every hour of the day that I was free, you know, that I was at home, you know, and I, I'd say I'd be up till three o'clock in the morning. And I think my my last deadline last year was due in before Christmas. So I thought, great, I'm going to I'm not going to have anything to do at Christmas. I can enjoy Christmas with family and go out and whatever. But whatever happened, there were some delays. So I had to go over Christmas into the first week of New Year. And that was my whole holidays gone. You know, I said, I can't do that again. I was on the verge of complete burnout. And I, I, I said to myself, you know, I don't even know if I want to continue writing because I didn't want to sacrifice. I'd already sacrificed a lot, but I couldn't bring myself to sacrifice anymore. Do you uh, think that you're learning now how to pace yourself a little better? Oh, absolutely. Like with these three books that I'm working on at the moment and soon a fourth and probably a fifth, I've spaced out the deadlines. So there could be four months or six months between them. So they're not all crashing together. You know, so I don't have three or four editors looking for work, you know, to review at any one time. You know, I'm going to finish one book, then I'll finish the other. Now, I'm some days I can be doing the interviews for one book. Another day I'll be doing the interviews for a different book, but I will never anymore work on more than one book on in one day. Did and you fact, have trouble keeping it all in your head at the same time? It can be difficult. Yeah, because if you're writing about Elm Street and you know the horror genre that's a very specific thing sure but then to, to flip over to work on Walter Hill a Walter Hill Western or to go interview some musicians for hired guns they are such different worlds that you need to adjust yourself interviewing I, I don't know if you feel the same about this interviewing can be such a strange personal experience because it's almost like you have to acclimatize and adjust to the personality of the person you're interviewing 100 percent that can take a lot out of you because if you're speaking to many people in one day across different disciplines and different interests, you know, you become a little bit schizophrenic. There's something going on there. You know what I mean? And that I think took its toll on me as well. Just trying to be a different person to different people. I can tell you, you know, this show, Story Beat, um, I have had all sorts of different disciplines, people that practice different disciplines, writers, producers, directors, actors, cinematographers, uh, sound people, painters, photographers. I've had all kinds of different disciplines on the show. And in some way, because I'm not doing it every single day, 
uh, in some ways, it's refreshing to me to not have the same thing over and over and over again. Well, yeah. you don't have the same thing over and over and over again either, but you're trying to do everything at one time, and that's really hard to do. It was, and that's I, I said, I said to my wife, you know what? After I went over into January last year, after those three books were turned into the publisher, I said, you know, what? I think I'm going to take maybe three or six months off before I take on another project. So I began that. Three weeks went by, and I said. I need to start a book. <laughs> <laughs> I need. I, I couldn't. I had gotten so used to not stopping since the Tom DeChillo book came out. I literally every day writing that I missed it. Even though I was on the verge of complete burnout at that point, I said I need to be working. I need to be writing. I need to. I need to be engaged. I find myself now that I can't watch movies passively anymore. I'm reading into them, and if I'm going to be reading into them, I might as well be writing about them. So I have to find, search within, find a subject that I, I love, that I'm going to be happy to write about for a year. You know, that I'm going to be, if you're going to be watching um, Nightmare on Elm Street movies, for example, that's 10 movies, including, or whatever, 11 movies, including the remake. So you have to be really happy to be watching those 11 movies for a year. You know, and I was, I was for the most part, there's you know, one or two of them not great, but. Are, are you saying that you are no longer able to enjoy a movie like as if you're just a kid and you're watching it for the first time? I find it very hard. I find it very hard to switch off the writer in me. So recently I was, I tried because I love Westerns. Westerns are probably my favorite genre. I was going back to watch those John Ford's, John Wayne Westerns or the Anthony Mann, James Stewart ones. And I found myself going, I'm enjoying this. So why don't I write about it? So that's a hint for one of the next books, not necessarily those particular people I mentioned, but I said, this is what I want to do. It makes sense. Westerns were there since the beginning. I've loved them all my life. So why not work with them? You know, and um, but if it's if it comes to a, a Friday night in with my wife and she says, go pick a movie. So I go up into the movie room upstairs, you know, and there's about four or five thousand movies up there. I won't be down for two hours because I'll be picking <laughs> things off the shelf, looking at them going. You know, I just I'm very indecisive when it comes to things like that, because I'm so used to going, I have to watch this because I'm going to be writing about it tomorrow. Or I'm going to be interviewing somebody from it. So I, I got so used to that method of I have to watch this movie that when it comes to a movie I don't have to watch, I'm terribly indecisive. Are there current franchises or a series of movies that you like that are different from what you've been writing about? Not currently. I mean, if, terrible for me to say this as a movie buff but i have no interest in contemporary cinema hmm. um the only the only films i've seen in a theater in the last five years were the three recent halloween movies and that's probably partly due to in my town there's only like a multiplex now the old cine one screen cinema is gone and all these these multiplexes all they show really is kids movies and I, when i say that i mean like marvel movies pixar movies superhero movies and they have absolutely no interest for me. So I tend just to stay away. Hmm. I've gotten to the stage now where I kind of think that I just want to spend my time doing something I like. Sure. You know, I went, I went through a period of writing for magazines and newspapers. And often when you're doing that, you're watching movies or reviewing albums or you're, you're reviewing books or whatever. You're going through things that you wouldn't necessarily enjoy anyway. And that was one of the things I gave up was the journalism. Because I think, you know, life's too short to be watching, reading whatever about things that you have no interest in. So the great thing about writing books is I get to write and talk about things that really, really inspire me and that I'm passionate about. So when you don't have to do these things, you tend not to. <laughs> so you're clearly, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but you're clearly a very deep researcher. You spend time really digging in and your books show that it's filled with information that you couldn't have just gotten by one phone call or one letter. It had to have been deep research. Yeah. How long do you take to figure out what it is you want to focus on in order to research and how long does it take to then gather that up before you're kind of ready to put things together, whether it's to start interviewing or whether it's to start writing, how long does that take you? Okay. Well, I usually, with every um, contract since Tom DeChilla book, I've given my editors one year because I think it sounds like a very short span of time, but I think it really gets you going. It gets you moving. It gets you researching, watching what you need to watch making contacts with people that you want to, to speak to. So I tend to, well, this is what I've learned because like I say, last year was so hectic. I was, I ended up doing some interviews with people when the book was almost finished. And that's terrible because then you have to go back to a chapter, tear it all up, put them in, recontextualize it, you know? So now what I'm doing is with these three books, 
I'm only doing interviews before I start writing, you know, the actual, the prose or whatever. So I've learned again to go straight for the people you want to talk to before you do anything. So in that case, usually it's, well, what, what am I going to be writing about? And usually, as I say, it's teams, you know, so screenwriters, obviously the directors, if I can get them. Um, cinematographers that I love, and that's probably reflected in my output, you know, two books on cinematographers, because cinematographers, they have the technical side of things, but they're also visual storytellers. 100%. So if you get the right people, they can talk about the cinematographer, Jack Haken from this, uh, Nightmare Down Street 1 and 2. He would he said in the book, he's a story guy, first and foremost. And he loved those deep social context teams that Wes Craven put into A Nightmare on Elm Street. And he was able to kind of parlay that stuff into his visuals. So when you speak to someone like Jack, who can not only tell you how he pulled off some intricate shots, but talk about the teams and meet you on that level, as Robert England did, for example. Robert England is a very, very deep intellectual guy. And again, he spoke about, he. you know, when I when I would bring up teams, I'm always kind of, conscious of am i overreaching here you know because some people you bring up teams and especially if it's something kind of socio-political or if you're talking about class or things like that some people just they don't either want to talk about it or they don't necessarily see it so you go into interviews and you're kind of going okay i need a backup because if, if that doesn't work well then i'm gonna maybe just talk about the technical side of a scene or a shot or whatever but the likes of jack haken and robert were so willing to talk about these teams that you're really dark disturbing teams in some cases because they re relate to real life you know and that's one of the great things about Nightmare on Elm Street I find is that the teams in there behind the glove behind the mask and the hat this is really about troubled teenagers and troubled society because it's issues that go on behind every picket fence behind every front door of every home you know alcoholism can creep into anybody's house you know and that's represented in Freddy in certain homes in the Elm Street series you know or domestic abuse things like that sure so so these are really serious teams to be talking about to some people. And, you know, you might be talking to an actor who s just might say, oh, well, I just turned up on set and I gave my performance and didn't really think about it. You know, so you kind of go, all right, I need something else well, to talk about. So my training as a screenwriter, part of the training that I received was, and this disagrees with a lot of people, by the way, but part of my training was when you first sit down to construct whatever the story is, you shouldn't think about a theme. You should think about what's the story, what's the plot, how does it unfold? And after you've written at least one draft, then you go back and you think, well, what themes am I expressing here? Because the tendency is if you're thinking about theme to start, you sometimes force yourself down dead end alleys. And so it's it's freer, this is again my training, to to just write story and then worry about theme after the fact. Now, what you're saying is some actors probably have something similar going on in their head. They just want to act the part. They just want to delve into the lines and say what's there and not have to worry about what's behind it in the totality of the story. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Yeah. And I mean, that's the, the risk you run sometimes is overanalyzing certain things. Sure. And that's why it's great then when you do meet somebody who kind of seize those teams that you're talking about or can you know give you even further information on that so you know i always kind of go into these things expecting that either we can talk about teams we can talk about ideas or we can talk about the technical aspects of things and i'm interested in both so but there are certain people like i say certain crew members or certain you know people within the movie who i always try to go for first because usually what attracts me to these movies are the teams you know Elm Street is brilliant on the surface. You can just enjoy it as a great horror movie, right. as a popcorn movie. As as Robert England said, the 12 year old, 10 year old kid watching Nightmare on Elm Street on a Saturday night with his pizza, with his buddies are not thinking about social class or social problems. They're just enjoying a damn good Freddy movie. But those teams will work on them over time, as they did with me. That makes complete and utter sense. What are some of the things that you do? Once you've got an idea, do you sit down and figure, I'm going to construct the book this way? Or do you just work purely chronologically? Or do you think about an outline of a, of how you're going to present the story? Not really. I tend to kind of go, if there's certain movies in a director's canon or in, a, say, a franchise's canon that I, I really, really love, I tend to work on those first. You know, and I kind of get the get the really passionate stuff down on the page because, you know, that's bursting to come out. So and I try and get those interviews as well done. So I, I don't really have a kind of a, a true line, you know, in terms of chronology or anything like that. Even Walter Hill, like I didn't start 
you know, at hard times and end up with dead for a dollar or anything like that. It was kind of, let's write about the movies that are really, really what, what inspired me to write about the book in the first place or that subject in the first place, and then kind of craft everything around that, you know, and then the book for me kind of finds itself as I'm editing, you know, it's, it's again, I, it's, I can't really put it into academic terms from a literature perspective, because I, I, I don't really come from that world, but to me, it's just, it makes sense whatever way I do it you know I, I kind of find the book as I'm going and if it reads well to me I kind of go okay I'm happy with that do you ever find yourself looking at your book and going well there's something not quite right here and you have to work a while to figure out how to put that structure back together there have been times where I feel I wasn't fair to a movie or the people I've interviewed and I really really struggled David was was great in this uh, David McGifford the hardest chapter I ever had to write was the Nightmare on Elm Street tree chapter for the Elm Street book and that's because, A, I love the movie so much, I wanted to do it total justice. But also because that was a difficult shoot. There was, there was a bit of a clash going on between the director and the, and the crew and the director and some of the actors and some of the crew. Some of the crew are older, kind of coming from old Hollywood union days. Some of the other crew were coming from just independent, you know, no, not much training or they weren't unionized. You know, they were just, they were, they were, they were kids, basically. So there was a bit of tension on set. And I didn't want any one person to be singled out for, oh, so-and-so was an asshole to work with or anything like that. And some <laughs> of the interviews were coming back a little bit harsh. And I didn't want that book to be a kind of a hell all or a kind of a some revealing thing, a kind of a you know bitching going on. I didn't want any of that. So I, I struggled for a while to kind of be fair to everybody. And I rewrote parts of it and rewrote parts of it. And I recontextualized, you know, um, some of the lines. So it didn't make... You know, you got to a certain part of a behind the scenes situation and somebody looks bad and all of a sudden you have five five people kind of contributing and saying, yeah, that, that guy was an asshole that day or something like that. Like, I had to take out some of that because I didn't want it to be that kind of book. I never do. It's a celebration at the end of the day of the work of the art. So, I, you know, I, I asked David, would he would he read this chapter and would he did he think I was fair? Because David being a first AD, he's a he's a crew guy. You know what I mean? He's seen every as, aspect of the, of the crew. So he knew he knew I was being fair once I got to a certain point and I had taken out some things which were said which didn't sit right with me. They were a little bit a little bit too nasty. So I said, you know what, I'm not gonna include that. I was gonna say, just so the listeners know, we're talking about the the great first AD David McGifford, who has also been an, a guest on this show, and that is a, a good friend of Wayne's. So that's how uh, we're talking about David McGifford actually helping Wayne to uh, contextualize, I guess, the the structure of the book, how it works. Yeah, I mean, I was I was second guessing myself on that chapter so much, and I was stressing out over it. You know, I and because I become friends with all these people as well through the course of the book, on both sides. You know, so, you know the, the guys who are kind of ragging across at each other. You know, and I didn't want anybody to be painted in in a bad light. Listen, the, there's plenty of documentaries out there on Elm Street. If anybody wanted to read deeper into the, the Discord, you know, they they can find it. But my book was was not about that. How many times have you read? I'm sorry, not read, but how many times have you watched each of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies in order to do what you've done? How many times? Well, countless, absolutely countless, and that's I'm talking one to six. So the I would say the kind of the the classic franchise, not not taking into account reboots or anything like that, or right, the, the right. mashup with with Jason. But um, I've been watching them avidly since I was a kid. But as Robert England said, these things they kind of work on you, you know. So once I was old enough to kind of recognize certain themes that were there within Wes Craven's script and his ideas, I thought there's something really interesting here beyond the horror movie aspect of it. And I always said, that's something I really want to write about because I say kind of sociology is an element of, of cinema that I'm really interested in. And I thought there's a lot of sociological commentary going on in these films, whether it's obvious or not, or whether I'm just reading into it. But that's the beauty of being a writer as well. You're kind of your own boss to kind of say, well, I see this, <laughs> you know, and if you can back it up with some good evidence, well, then. I think works. the closest thing you get to it, uh, as far as I, my perspective, is that uh, you see it in George Romero's work, especially uh, the, the dead movies. Uh, there's a very sociological aspect to them if you look behind the curtain a little bit. That's what you're talking about, yes? Absolutely, yeah. And and they, like Elm Street, work perfectly fine as functioning horror movies, pure entertainment. So right. 
if you you know if you if you, if you didn't want to be doing that re kind of research, you can just enjoy them as horror movies. But if you want, that sociological stuff is totally there. Well, I think that's what makes them special is that they have a, a more than one dimension to them. They're not just on a surface. Absolutely, and that's why I think you know. Yeah, and that's you know I was offered in the after in the aftermath of Nightmare on Elm Street book, I was offered some other franchises to write about and i had to really think about that because some of those franchises don't have enough for me stuff behind the surface to write about right there were things i like you know I, there were films that i've watched down the years and really enjoyed but there has to be some substance there on a thematic level mm -hmm. when it comes to the ideas and you know or even if it's just filmmakers who i find really interesting to write about that will grab me as well but you know, some of these franchises weren't of interest to me so i didn't pounce on them but there, there was kind of a good feedback from the Elm Street book you know it, it got some really good reviews and it did well on Amazon so I think that maybe made people think maybe you should write more horror books <laughs> but that, <laughs> that that wasn't me you know that's not really what I'm about well you've so. already said that you have to connect to the subject it can't just be about whatever someone's assigning to you you are, really have to feel your way through it oh absolutely it's the only way I could do it and when I came when I agreed to do Halloween you know, Halloween was something that was there with me since childhood. And there are certain films in that series, which I absolutely love. And there's some great filmmakers in there. There's great uh, cinematographers, editors, so some great actors. And I thought this, that, that'll be a fun one to do, keep me entertained. Halloween has plenty to talk about. There's no question about that. Oh, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't talk for a moment about my dear friend, Jim Doyle, who was the special effects guy on the original Nightmare on Elm Street. And Jim is the one, he's, he's been on this show, by the way, so anybody that wants to hear what Jim has to say, please check it out on storybeat.net. But Jim created Freddy's glove with the, with the claws, whatever you want to call it. Talk about that glove for a moment. How important is the glove itself to the franchise and to what has happened since? That glove is an absolute symbol for the whole franchise. I mean, it's, how to say this, it's the weapon of choice it's the tool of death so it's the ultimate scary instrument you know it's this horrific looking thing you know and when you see it in the movie tearing people open but there's something i don't know what it is there's something about the way robert england wears it as well he has this kind of pose i think sometimes in the movies where he's holding it with his his shoulders a little bit up and he's doing a little bit of a john wayne walk and he's it's like as if he's almost carrying you know his gun and it's such a powerful symbol you know, he, he might be walking slowly towards you and the glove is just kind of hanging down. And it's just this horribly, it's a horrific instrument of death. And I think it's just a symbol for the whole franchise at this point. I mean, I've seen some DVD releases where all that's on it is the glove. You know, uh -huh. that's all it needs to say, <laughs> you know. It, and there's a great poster, actually. I think it was maybe the UK VHS release and cinema release poster where it's this kind of, it's the suburban street. So it's those lovely kind of suburban, perfectly manicured lawns and white picket fence houses. And there's an image superimposed over it of Nancy kind of asleep, but coming in over her head and over that street is the glove. And that's a perfect symbol of what the whole film and whole series is about, which is we're talking middle class suburbia being invaded by this utter monster, you know, which is not just Freddy the monster himself, literally, but the monster of what he represents so it's the this kind of the american dream of middle class quiet nice homes being invaded by are corrupted by what goes on behind the closed doors and what goes on between the parents or between the parents and the kids but that glove is a symbol of all of that i will guarantee I you when that was being created when the glove was being figured out that it was more a moment of well how do we make something horrific and you know horrible looking than it was to be symbolic of an entire series. No one knew there was going to be a series. They just knew they were trying to make one rather low budget horror movie. And so you're doing the yeah. best you can with what you got. And I, I'll guarantee you there was no thought toward this being a symbol for a whole movie. And yet that's what it became. Yeah. I think that's fascinating. I'm just curious about Walter Hill. I want to talk about him just briefly because uh, I think that book is outstanding too. I think Walter Hill's movies are better known than he is. I don't think in Hollywood, he's legendary. People know who he is in Hollywood, but I don't think he's got a famous name like a Steven Spielberg or a George Lucas. It's not that kind of name. What is it about Walter Hill that makes him special for you? For me, Walter, there's no fat in his films. 
they're so economical, they're so lean. And it comes back to the idea of genre films hitting those registers head on, you know. And Walter reminds me of someone like Raoul Walsh or Howard Hawks, where he can kind of jump within certain genres, but still maintain a kind of an an auteur voice, but without being overtly, say, stylistic. Like Walter Hill doesn't have a set style as such, but there's a certain, like say, leanness to them. And there's a certain toughness to them. And I will even say, I know it's not popular these days, but a certain masculinity to them. And I don't mean that in a toxic sense, in that his characters are kind of, they're hard men from hard situations. They're, from they're, hard t- they're tough guys. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, Walter can go from 48 hours to Brewster's Millions, to Crossroads, to Geronimo, you know, four completely different movies. To The Warriors. Exactly. You know, every every Walter Hill film is so different, but yet so... To, to Alien. Yeah, and, the, you know, The Getaway, <laughs> Sam Peckinpah's The Getaway, which was one of his early scripts. He's just an incredible filmmaker. For me, it's quality. There's a certain consistency of quality in his work. And I think he's underrated as well as a stylist, as a visual stylist. Because if you look at something like Last Man Standing with Bruce Willis, which is not one of his better reviewed films and in fact i started out not liking liking it when it first came out but now i think it's my favorite walter hill movie for Mm. various reasons i think because i came to it as a bruce willis fan not as a walter hill fan so i was looking at it going where's david addison from moonlighting where's bruce willis of die hard you know this is a completely different bruce he's not talking very much he's doing a bit of a robert mitchum clint eastwood kind of thing where he's just you know stoic and iconic whatever but when I went back to it a couple of years later, and by the time I got to writing about it, I was gushing endlessly, as you know from reading a book. Sure. About the, the style of the film, the production, the action scenes, the way it's edited, the music, which I think it's Roy Cooter's best music ever, full stop. And when I was talking to Walter about it, he was very happy that I liked it as much as I did, because if there's one thing that's kind of consistent about my love of Walter... My favorite Walter movies are the ones, for some reason, which tend to have not done very well. So, you know, I prefer another 48 hours to 48 hours, and that's probably quite controversial. (laughs) 48 hours is a pretty good movie, and it did turn Eddie Murphy into a massive star, basically. Massive, yeah. And that's that was interesting, you know, so it was great to talk to Walter about... See, Walter was an interesting interview because he doesn't... He's one of those people who doesn't really like to talk about his own work or talk about himself. Mm -hmm. So you have to approach the interview kind of differently. And I learned earlier on, I went in expecting this, that he wouldn't be, you know, giving me the whole rundown of the production of every movie. I I was happy with that because I got that from everybody else anyway. So I just wanted to get Walter's take on some things. But what I found was where I met Robert England on that thematic social context thing on Elm Street with Walter it was our shared love of film history and our shared love of old Hollywood. And that really opened Walter up. Maybe it warmed him to me. I don't know. But we had this really lovely exchange. We were talking, gushing about Raoul Walsh. And, you know, he said, Wayne, hold on one moment there. I have to go get something and show you. And he went off and he, he got this letter. It was perfectly, and the envelope was perfect. He said, this letter is 50 years old. I just found it recently. I lost it and I'm never going to lose it again. And he opened it and he showed me and it was this handwritten letter from Raoul Walsh. Wow. Encouraging Walter, you know, to pursue his directorial career and giving some advice. And for that moment, I forgot that I was interviewing Walter Hill. We were just two movie fans gushing over Raoul Walsh. And that to me was just like one of the most memorable experiences of my writing career. So, you know, I was blown away by that moment. And I kind of made the rest of the conversations easier, I think, because we had shared that little moment, you know. Little things like that in an interview can really open up people who might not otherwise be easy to interview. Or of course. Of, and, and that's true even on a show like this where there's a, there's a little bit of tension in the beginning of almost any interview because this subject, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you've interviewed plenty of people, the subject tends to be a little wary of what am I going to be asked here. So there's a period of time in almost any interview where you're looking to find a way to find commonality so that you're not, it could be an adversarial relationship in an interview, but that's not what's good for what you do or what I do. Um, You're trying to find commonality. Absolutely. I mean, that was a big thing with the Burt Reynolds book, because when I approached people for that book, it was nearly a wall of silence or it was it was a wall of protection around Bert because sure. he was so used to getting or those people as well were so used to having journalists approach them, writers approach them, looking to talk to them. But, you know, Bert had been burned so much by the media and by writers that people are were naturally wary 
you know, so it, it, it's interesting because one of my best friends, Jimmy Lewis, God bless me, passed away recently. I met but our on that book, but our first exchange was him saying me, no, <laughs> I had approached him for an interview. Thanks. Nick McLean recommended him because Nick worked with him a lot. He was a good friend of Bert's, very close, lived in the same town. He was also Bert's stunt double, came to his acting school and acted in several Bert movies. And he had his own career outside of Bert's movies. But my initial um, contact with Jimmy was, you know, I explained what I'm doing. I'd, I'd love to talk to you about Bert and about the movies. And he just said, no. I just thought, okay, well, that's Jimmy not coming on board. So Nick went back to him and he said, Jimmy, you should talk to Wayne. Wayne is all about the movies. He's all about the art. He's celebrating Bert. He's not writing a personal expose. He's not digging into the divorces or the scandals or whatever it is. He really wants to celebrate Bert as a director, an actor, a writer. So Jimmy came back and he was, you know, initially, uh, you know, he's still a little bit wary. He's like, okay, Wayne, so what is it you want to know? And as Jimmy as well was a great you know movie fan like Walter a film buff going back to the old days so we just connected and he realized that I, that is what it, what it was about which was the work not the personal things so we really met on that level and we became really really good friends and again I, I said earlier on that one of the best things for, for me it is the best thing about being a writer it's the people you meet along the way mm -hmm. made so many friends because of this endeavor of mine. And if I never made a penny from these books, I'd still be the happiest man in the world because of the people I've met, the friends well, I've made. That's a question of how you value the richness of life that has nothing to do with money at all. Absolutely. I mean, if you have, when you know people like Nick McLean or Jimmy Lewis, that's to me, that's the best you can ask for. Have there been any people along the way that you wish you could have interviewed that you were unable to, either because they just wouldn't or whether they passed on or whatever? Um, Wes Craven obviously would have been a huge one for sure. me for the Elm Street yeah. book. I think he was gone maybe a year or two when I started that book. And a friend of mine, Tom actually, Tom DeCillo, was going to put me in contact with his wife, but that never, never happened. Um, generally, there aren't, you know, I've, I've been lucky in that I've gotten the people I've really wanted to speak with. And I tend not to go necessarily for the, the bigger name, like the stars. I always, like I say, I go for actors, cinematographers, screenwriters first, because those to me are the people, they're the, they're the creators, the originators of that story, or they're the ones bringing it to life. So to me, that's very important to speak to those people. You know, if I can get actors, great. If if not, well, that, that's fine. Sometimes I speak to, you know, somebody who wasn't in the lead role, but they had it a smaller crucial role or I think just give me some insight into the process behind the scenes or the director or something like that so but to me it's, it's very crucial it's they're the first people I go for generally you know the directors and screenwriters and cinematographers well you're focused on the creation of the movie not so much the celebrity of the movie and that's where I come from in this show too I'm more interested in the create how people create rather than what to talk about the outcome of it or the finished product and so I think that's what's fascinating to me, and I think it's the same for you. I've been having the most marvelous conversation with Wayne Byrne for an hour now, and we're going to slowly wind the show down. And I'm just wondering, you have worked with lots of people at this point. You've met lots of people in the business. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you have an oddball, weird, quirky, offbeat, or just plain funny story you can share with the listeners. I could probably scare up a couple. <laughs> okay, yeah, let me tell I you. bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not going to name the book, but when I approached several actors, they came back for an interview. They came back to me with a price list <laughs> for interviews. <laughs> and I thought, is this a thing? Because being a journalist before, I never encountered that. And I, I was like, I can't do that. You know, I, I don't pay people for interviews. It's not how I do things. <laughs> so, you know, and the, the, the price list would be kind of absurd. It'd be like, for half hour, it's this price. But if you want to do an hour and a half, I'll take some money off. So it was like this real business transaction. I'm like, no, no, this is not how I do things. So we'll just leave it at, at that. So um, I, I guess when I thought about it, I was kind of thinking, you know what, that's probably because of maybe the convention world where every interaction, every human interaction now at a convention is monetized. You know, if you want to talk to somebody for one minute, that's $20, please. You know, that kind of thing. I don't know. It just sits uneasy with me. So I would never, but ever it, pay it for it. It should sit uneasy with you. You shouldn't be paying people <laughs> to interview them. That's for sure. No, not at all. And by the way, did I send you my price list? <laughs> you did, and I enjoyed the zero price on every every comment. <laughs> so, but uh, that was um yeah that was a learning thing you know and I just you know I leave it at that if somebody mentions money so another absurd and funny thing happens to me sometimes because I'm a librarian by profession and I've had a couple of instances where people have come into my library 
and ask, do you have that book, The Cinema of Tom DeCillo? I'm studying it in college. <laughs> and I'd be like, we do. <laughs> and by, by the way, <laughs> you know, so I've had a couple of those encounters where I do, literally do had to check. Do their eyes open wide? Oh, all of a sudden they're telling you everything about the course and about what they're studying. And, you know, and I love it, of course. And I love those interactions. That's, you know, that's the best thing when you, you can meet on, on a common ground about a, an artist or something like that. And when you've written a book about something, people, of course, want to know, did you talk to so-and-so? What were they like? You know, they want the little insights on the movies. And of course, if I, if I have the time, I'll give them. But um, yeah, I've had to check out my own books to customers. It's got to be very fulfilling when that happens. It really is, you know, and even today I was in work and somebody had brought back the Tom DeChilla book and the Walter Hill book together. They had to two of them out and I had to put them back on the shelf. You know, it's, it's a strange <laughs> experience, you know, but um, it's great. I, I mean, if people are taking them out and whether I'm the one handing them to them, it doesn't bother me. You know, I'm happy that they're, they're going to be read or enjoyed or maybe not enjoyed. But. I, th I think that's a lot of fun because you get to you get an actual up close and personal interaction with someone who has actually read your book. So that's yeah, really cool. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, no, that's, that's great. really great. And then I guess another kind of strange, surreal thing, but a, a totally wonderful thing is when people I meet through this work are usually my, a lot, a lot of the time they're, they're my heroes. They're the people who've given me this life and they've given me life since I've been four years old through cinema. Some of those people have often asked me to sign a book for them, you know, and that's a very surreal. And wow. I was, I was over in LA recently and Nick McLean invited me over to his place and he said he was going to bring over some, some friends, you know, and these people arrived, you know, some people I'd met before, some people I hadn't. But they were all people who made the, the movies that have given me this life. And some of them arrived with their books, not just the Walter Hill book or whatever, but with several books. And they would ask me to sign them. And my, my mind is going, what? What's, how did this happen? You know, I should be asking them to sign my DVDs, <laughs> you know. But that to me is one, again, it's the people, you know, it's just the most wonderful thing. And for Nick to have done that for me, you know, to bring me over to his house and have a party in my honor and have all these people that, you know, I've spoken to down the years and some people I haven't, some people you just thought, you know, it'd be nice for Wayne to meet. It was incredible. It was one of the best weeks of my life. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And I think that that's great of him to do. And it's really fulfilling for you. It's a really great thing when people recognize your work and laud it in that way. I think that that's a lot of fun. All right. So last question for you today, Wayne. Um, you've already given us tons of interesting things to think about and advice throughout the show, but I'm wondering, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can give to those who are maybe starting out trying to be writers of film history or biography or whatever, or, or maybe they're, they've done a little bit and they're trying to get to the next level? Yeah, you know, um, I'll try and break it into two, one from the kind of the film historian perspective and the other from just from the, the, the writing perspective. From the film historian point of view, I, I would say to everybody, go and discover the whole 120 odd years of cinema. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the pioneers. Go back to D.W. Griffith, to Raoul Walsh, to Orson Welles, to John Ford. No matter how controversial they may be or how out of step they may seem, you know, with the, with the current political climate, you know, movies made in the 1920s or the 1910s, you know, they had different outlooks on life and different politics. But I say, look at D.W. Griffith and see how he changed the course of cinema and see how he developed silent cinema to become, you know, this great art form that we now celebrate today. Go and then follow through to Alfred Hitchcock and Orson Welles and... God, it's the new Hollywood period, Dennis Hopper, you know, I could name a million filmmakers. And then you have the foreign directors, the foreign pioneers, Sergei Eisenstein, Louis Bunuel, you know, Federico Fellini. Go back, go and explore because I've, I've done some teaching, you know, in various schools and colleges. And I've seen people who turn in their papers and but they didn't watch the movies. They may have just read about it in a book and were able to answer, you know, theoretically about the movie. But I find that where's the joy in that? Go back and watch Citizen Kane and appreciate it for the supreme piece of art that it is. And not just talk about how great the cinematography is on the paper experience what you're writing about to me is ultimately what I'm saying because it can't be teary or else it's just it's going to be dry I think your writing is going to be dry if you're only talking teary so experience the films you won't always love them some of them are contentious and out of date but you might find something you are a filmmaker you'll absolutely love and that's been one of the the great pleasures of doing what I do is I get to go back always I'm always searching for films I didn't get to see I'm searching for those Griffith movies or Ford movies that I haven't seen, you know, because I maybe want to reference them or I want to write about them or whatever it is. 
or I want to teach them. I want to, if I'm going to be talking about Griffith or Ford or whoever, I need to go back and watch as many of those movies as I can to get a better understanding. So I would say expose yourself to as much of cinema as you can. You know, we all have preferences. We all might just love horror movies or we might love action movies or whatever it is, but be open enough to experience cinema in all of its varieties is what I would say in that regard. And I would say as a writer, this is the coming at it from the writer's point of view. The advice I would give to people is don't let anybody say, or don't let anybody's cynicism or pessimism put you off. Don't let them say you're wasting your time. You're never going to be published. You don't even know how to write because some people will take that on board and never put pen to paper. If there's a book you want to write, write it. That's the way I got into it because I wanted a book on Tom DeCillo. Nobody else wrote it. I wanted one on my shelf. So I had to, to, to do that. I had to write that book myself. Um, and just don't let a college put you off either. If you don't get into a college or a course, don't let that make you think that you're not good enough. Because again, I've experienced that and it, it's completely false. You know, you're an editor or a publisher will see if you're good enough. And again, don't take rejection as putting you off. Just keep doing it. And I've met so many people down the years who, you know, they ask me for advice or they ask me, or they say, I want to be a writer. And I say, well, what have you done? How many pages have you done? Have you, have you a book written? What is it? Or a short story? And they, no, I've never written anything because I don't know how. And I also say, but if there's one thing we are armed with in this life, it's words. They're free of charge. You may need a, a pen or a word processor. Okay. But we have words. And if you have an idea, put it down on paper. You can refine it later. You can get help with editing, but just begin. Get those words on the page somehow or other. Work for me. Might not work for you, but it worked for me. And if it I works for me, I'm sure it can work for anybody else. I think those are very inspiring thoughts. All of them. Everything that you just said was very inspiring. And especially because you yourself experienced these things. And you know from firsthand experience that you can go from, hey, you didn't get accepted at college. You weren't a lifelong reader. And yet you've written all these books and continue to write more. I think that that's extraordinarily uh, wonderful advice for people to just do it as they say, or yeah. the, the old Nike phrase, just do it, you know. Um, exactly. So. And it, it sounds, you know, it might sound flippant, you know, it's such an easy thing to say to somebody, but it's so true. Because if you don't write that first word, that book won't get written. So. Well, that is an absolute truth. There's no question. If you don't write it, it doesn't get written. So you can't go down to the store and buy your book for yourself. You have to create the book. So that's uh, absolutely true. Wayne Byrne, this has been an absolutely fabulous hour plus on Storybeat today. And I cannot thank you enough for spending uh, so much time with me and, and sharing your wisdom and your experiences uh, with the listeners today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anytime, Stephen. It's such a pleasure to be here talking to you today. And so we've come to the end of today's Storybeat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Storybeat episodes to you. Storybeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.